to bid you good day. And we begin again, as always, from a place that seeks a new understanding, not simply the same, but a newer, deeper, greater understanding, often accompanied by vision, by purpose, and by discovery. Therefore, as we continue with the subject of value and those things that give value to life, look further and with greater vision to where you stand on the subject. For the purpose of this discussion, then, is always to make life more vital, more purposeful, more rich. The purpose of this series, then, is not simply to enrich or to line your pockets with monies or golds, but to also then line them with a greater understanding so that as you attract these properties into your life, they will bring more to you than those material things or objects that give temporary meaning to a moment. You will note about you, then, the accumulation of things in the world, the accumulation of buildings that line the city streets, accumulation of properties or things in your garage, in your closets, those things that you gather to make your life easier or more interesting or more colorful then have value. They add to your life in some way. They contribute to your life in some way. But how much and for how long, that perhaps is an excellent question to ask. So our discussion as we continue to unfold it is part two then of giving value to life. I will remind you again that the purpose of life is always life. To further it, to draw it to you and in you. So in essence it could be said that the purpose of life is simply the breath as you draw that to you, as you inhale life sustaining prana. But then of course there is the exhalation, the moment in which you pour it all out again exchanging the value of one breath for the new value of the next. To this degree, all is in balance, all is as it should be. You receive one breath, you return the last one. All things remain in balance and you are well nourished in the exchange. But what happens if just for a moment you do decide to inhale a little bit more often than you exhale, deciding that you must hold the breath just a little bit before you return it. Well, already then you may at first receive the benefit of more prana, of more attention to your being, but if you cannot then exhale the carbon dioxides and the toxins that build within the body very quickly, then even that which you have gathered to yourself for its benefit already becomes toxic. And it is the same with thoughts, you see. You will think a good thought, a kind thought, a positive thought. And so in the next moment you will say, that was very good, it was very beneficial, it made me feel so good. I will think another like thought. That one also works to your benefit. And so you say to yourself, that was such a good thought, a kind and loving thought. I need more thoughts just like that one. In fact, that was such a good and kind and loving thought. I'll think I'll keep it for a little longer so that the others will know what to do, how to follow. I will think other thoughts just like that. And you do. 
and for a time you receive the benefit of that. But then you have an over-accumulation of such thoughts and they sit and they sit within your being accumulating but what? Because energy when it is not exchanged in the value of the moment does not always increase in value perhaps as you have seen with those monetary things that one seeks to accumulate and so all things reasonable things even thoughts and feelings when they are not balanced or returned to their natural state sometimes begin to produce an overabundant effect or even a toxic effect and it is the same with those units of exchange or value associated with monies and so as we continue to unfold this topic then the importance here is not only how to accumulate wealth or how to assign value to things or ideas or purposes of life it is also how to maintain them in perfect balance. You see, in perfect balance, they will accumulate themselves in just the right order, with less chaos as well. Think upon it. If we stay with the example of the breath, the breath does not need to be told that another breath must follow. Thoughts do not need to be told that another thought must follow and with a bit of conscious direction they are kept in balance they nurture and they return all those things but again it is consciousness and conscious direction that keeps it so in your life then as you maintain that conscious flow the river the river of life will continue to support you and to sustain you perhaps the thought being that you always receive all those things that benefit within and without those things that support life and the meaning of life those things that direct you ever forward bringing fulfillment and fulfillment of desires now long ago as we continue to delve deeper and further we come to those things that were of value earlier in human life different than they are now for instance we might take a short journey to visit the caveman of old and they too had a certain accumulation of ideas and for them a great value of exchange was simply in bones and skins those things that would be needed at a winter those things that would be needed to make tools and these were exchanged at great gatherings as well just the right tool for just the right job as they say they were not interested in gold they did not have monies with which to exchange but it was needful things and so there are many different ways to value things, whether it is based upon need or want or desire. Depending upon how you categorize these ideas, you will relate to life in a different way. For instance, I will tell you that the lowest form of wanting, if you like, or attracting to you is that of craving. That which you crave and crave often is associated with suffering. To overly crave something, to believe that it is necessary or vital above and beyond all other things, creates an imbalance within your awareness. It creates an imbalance even within the breath. And so already you will not be able to breathe deeply and evenly when you are in a condition of craving the breath that you draw is sometimes too shallow and sometimes too deep according to how you are organized and so the body cannot draw from the breath its most sacredness 
it draws enough to support itself and to sustain itself. So for instance, those who crave one particular kind of food, for a very simple example, even if they stay away from it, even if they stay away from the attraction thinking it is too much of an addiction, at times they may even gain weight as an example. Because even the thought of that particular food causes the breath to display itself differently, causes the body then to hold itself differently. And the cells in the body will also then hold their energy, hold their weight, hold their position. In all processes of the body, from the breath through the elimination cycle, are impacted in this craving and it brings a form of suffering even if one does not yield to the craving. Well, you might say, why not simply yield to the craving then? If it's going to be that way anyway, why not give in to it altogether? Well, a part of your being wishes to share with you many different ways, many different approaches to life. And so to have or to have not gives the body and the being and the idea many different examples from which to learn. If craving then is the lower form, energetically speaking, of desire, then what is the highest form? Well, the highest form would be called a culmination. It would be called a crowning. And it is represented in the value state or on the physical state by gold. A topic that we now bring into, fold into this subject as the main topic heading is value, money, and now gold. Gold then, or a gold crown, is the culmination of energy. Here out of all the substances upon the earth, for as long as your history has ever recorded, nothing has both given others more craving and suffering or more crowning alchemical understanding, growth, and discovery. So here you have both a substance that has value, it has idea, it has frequency, symbolic and physical frequency. And so in all ways now we come to the thing that has had the most value upon the earth throughout history. And why? Would it not be that water, clear water to drink or a deep well, would have greater value than gold, a simple metallic substance? Would it not be that food would have much more of a value, a grain, for instance? But no, it has always been gold, at least where humanity is concerned. And so here is a fine time to delve into that. Gold has value and very high value. It has always been prized above all other metals, craved even, and guarded and protected. But when did humanity begin to do just that and why? Well, here we take a trip back in history for a time back even before a humanity existed upon the earth, any kind of humanity. So here from other worlds, I tell you, came the desire for gold. From other worlds, even before humanity came to be upon the earth, and even before that which ensouls humanity, or the collective energy of humankind at the soul level, existed upon other worlds and yes other planets as well in which gold was more plentiful than it is upon the earth gold as much value as it has is very little in plenty here upon the earth so upon other worlds as it was distributed in a particleized manner as dust even this space, gold dust, the universe distributed as it did, 
and it drifted to many other worlds more than it did to the earth. This did not matter to the humanity that formed upon the earth, but it did matter to those that embody the physicality that you call humankind. So here I tell you that long before you came to the earth, already there was a prize of gold. Already it had value. But in these other worlds that I described to you, for the most part it was not a monetary value. There was no gold standard tied to a money or economic system upon these other worlds, for gold was far too plentiful for that. But gold had, and indeed has, a many, many purposes, almost as if you were to think about your plastics of today something that could be molded into this, made into that, shaped and then dissolved again, shaped and made purposeful again, shaped and then created into something else. Gold can be eaten, by the way. You know it is not toxic like other metals are. And so upon other worlds, even before you were to express yourselves upon the earth, gold was made into a very particular kind of bread. Perhaps you have even heard at times that the ancients called gold the bread of life. Those that existed even before the ancient Egyptians knew how to make, not necessarily bake, but to make a particular kind of bread, a wafer-like substance that was infused with gold, a very particular kind of gold, a very particular elemental gold, and this did, in fact, not only bring wellness, but extend life, particularly upon other worlds of which I described to you before the earth. These bodies that I say to you already had longevity much longer than that upon the earth. It could be said that bodies upon the earth oxidize more quickly than those upon other worlds, and perhaps it would be notable to say that gold does not oxidize, by the way. And so even that is a little bit different or notable here upon the earth. As then upon the other worlds, gold was fashioned into bread, extending life, and it was given to almost all of the classes, but not all of them for reasons of a story that could best be told where other subjects are concerned. Best it is to say now that it was not a substance that was only given to the higher classes, it was given to most, and yet truth be told it did not suit all the kinds of beings that I described to you from these other worlds. I say to you other worlds because it is more than one that I describe, and for the sake of keeping to the named topic, we will hold it at that. Now then, this bread of life supported and sustained life in all of its different ways. It had a way of multiplying itself when it was known how to do that. Gold has a way of interacting with other metals in very unique ways that can expand its abilities or multiply it. And, of course, this the alchemists of long ago understood. It is not simply a matter of taking base metals or lower metals and simply converting or transmuting them to gold. There are other properties to consider. There are other procedures to take into account. And yet, I tell you that gold of a certain elemental quality can indeed be made to multiply. That which multiplies at times is more rare and at times it is less rare or less useful, in which case it was also given to other purposes and uses in this other world in which gold was more plentiful. So it was normal to live with this substance of value. Decorative it was in these worlds, just as you decorate with gold or gold leaf or 
fashion it into your jeweled items and such. And so long and longer ago, when beings from other worlds arrived upon the earth, they already arrived with this certain kind of gold. They did not initially come to seek it, but they did find it. The gold that they found upon the earth was not of the same elemental quality that they had found upon their world. Part of the reason for this is simply that the earth was a newer world than was the one in which they had come. Therefore the gold had accumulated in large proportion and easier deposits there. When they found the gold of the earth, it was useful. It offered itself to life extension and properties and such, but not to the degree that the gold upon their world did. And so the gold of the earth required more finding, more refining, in fact even more of the gold to make the certain amount or the same amount of this quality that was needed. And so almost from the very beginning, gold was scarce or thought to be scarce upon the earth as compared to another world. Almost from the beginning, gold being one of the more valuable substances upon the earth or so thought by those that gave it or assigned it that value. And already then it became sought after, if for no other reason then it was not as plentiful, not as easy to mine or extract. Upon the earth, the gold is more deeply held in pockets, in encrusted pockets, that are simply not as easy to come by as the gold of this other world. Still, and of necessity, those that had journeyed to the earth needed the gold not simply wanted it for its value, but truly needed the gold. And so they set aside, set about the complicated task of drawing it to them by what means they could, and they employed a variety of means, some known to their world and some that had to be crafted in order to accommodate the physical constraints of the earth, the earth's gravity being tighter, denser than the world that they had come to. Many of the properties associated with the earth were not as easy for those that came to the earth, and so that made the necessity for obtaining the gold that much more quickly necessary. So here I develop this part of the story for you. For the most part, by way of saying that even from the beginning gold had value and not even value to those that were native or natural to the earth. The value was brought here from another world altogether. Later, humanity, native earth humanity, took these properties, took these ideas and made it their own. Humanity being a very curious species, and at the time a very childlike or innocent species, it emulated, imitated its parents in the same way that children do today. If you say to your child you must value this dollar or this currency because we have worked very hard for it, we did not come by it very easily. Well, in the same way, the ancient humanity of which we speak heard or knew the same. Gold comes in a difficult way. It is difficult to obtain. It has many important properties. We must value it. We must care for it. We must protect it. And, and, there are others who want it. They want it enough that they may take it from us. And so here was born not only the idea that gold had value that was necessary, here as well was born the idea 
that if you do not protect it, hide it, keep it, accumulate it, hoard it, something may happen, you may find yourself without it, and oh, would life change then. So the idea of something external rather than necessary was born upon the earth almost from the beginning, you see. Now in the earlier example that I gave to you of cave man, here the exchange of value came from something that was practical and necessary. Bones that were shaped into tools, stones or obsidians or what it would be, necessary items, skins for warmth and others as well. All of this had a very practical and a very momentary value. But gold did not, at least not for those that were native to the earth. It was a value that was transferred here just as the idea was. And so it became a belief. We need gold in order to survive, or gold will set us free, or gold will lend to us a better life, and on and on. So I tell you that gold, while very important, necessary, valuable to your societies, to your cultures, and to how you see yourself, was never, never an original human thought. The thought the belief, the idea, the program, all of this came from elsewhere and was transferred to an innocent humanity looking to observe or to make a better life by trusting those that it believed were gods or God-like. Again, I say to you that gold has value upon the earth, in fact, a great deal of it and a great many more purposes by which it is not currently used. In fact, there will come a time when gold is not so prized as it is now, and then many of its uses will truly be discovered. But it will never be quite as plentiful as other metals, as other properties of the earth, and so eventually it will be set aside as a standard or as a value, as a monetary value. Monetary values will have another assignment altogether. But gold will still have value upon the earth when it is measured by achievement. When it is measured by what one can discover and the properties then that measure it according to, well, the sun after all. The symbol for gold, after all, is a small dot surrounded by a perfect circle. It is the same as the symbol for the sun. And the most perfect and most yellow gold is, in fact, a very golden, a very sunny yellow. And all of these properties, then, came from the long-ago time. Gold, as you know, is a transition metal, so symbolically it has always offered this as a possibility as well. Transition, transmutation, alchemically so. Even if you were to compare gold to other metals, chemically, it is the least reactive of all. It reacts very little to most acids. That, but by one simple mixture, is the only one that could attack it in a certain way. Because it is less reactive in this way symbolically, we could say as well that as a human being, also makes itself open to the world, responding to the needs of life more and reacting less, even in this way, that gold has a certain value. As gold is not reactive, it does not react to the other metals. However, it does dissolve in mercury. 
as gold does dissolve into mercury but not react with it I tell you that here in this statement for those that are interested in alchemy there is a very strong clue as well silver would dissolve in nitric acid as do other base metals but gold does not therefore this property is interesting to the refining process in this case we speak to the refining of metals but we also direct our thoughts then to the refining of the soul or of the human being in all of these ways then there were tests given to humanity long ago for those that offered themselves to the initiatic process in fact there were certain initiates that were given certain gold standard tests different than those of today but to ingest a certain amount of gold and to see what the toxins in the body what the acids of the body would do with that certain gold how would the body react now remember I have said to you that it does not affect the body that it can in fact be eaten but that does not mean that the body will not react or respond to its presence in a certain way and so when the highest quality of gold is given to the body and mixed with either the lower thoughts or the lower substances of the body created by the lower thoughts there is an outcome to that and when combined with certain other properties tests of initiation there are those that would come through such in a blinding light almost with golden eyes and golden thoughts and there were those that in their own way well turned inward or turned inside out that perhaps is the best way to put it there are those that would emerge from this with their eyes turned inward or to God or to the inner self or to the inner truths and there are those that in an effort to achieve or to pass a test instead were turned inside out and did not necessarily come out the other side in complement with themselves so you see upon the earth gold has also then had many different thoughts feelings and effects upon humanity gold then became a standard of wanting of desire of wealth long and longer ago as far back as you can measure human thought or human writings or human history gold has been prized and not simply by one culture above another by all all of them all of them in one way or another have or do value perhaps other precious metals as well but none as much as gold so why does it have such value now then and how long will that value last it will last as long as the economies measure themselves by value less things the more that humanity values paper economic trading pieces the more that gold will be more valuable of all in other words the more that the economies or the governments print more paper money the higher will be the value of gold now this could be described as a simple economic principle but perhaps there are other principles at work here to be considered perhaps the principles have more to do as the subject that we have been exploring how much value does life have who or what assigns that value and how does that value rise or fall 
That is where gold stands superior and to the other. That is where, because you see, here it is in your cells still. It is in the original thoughts. It is in the original thoughts of those that animated humanity. It is one of the first and the most original prizes of the earth. And so for a time it will remain that way. And to a fault, humanity will both crave it, cultivate it, and perhaps allow it to be its culmination or its crowning. All of this raising the bar for consciousness of the earth as well. If it is that you desire gold or wealth, that is fine. That is a very fine attribute to draw to yourself. And the more that you uphold its value, not only as wealth, but as that which brings wellness and understanding to the deep well within, then indeed, you may accumulate it to your heart's desire. But it is well to be clear of what it is that gold upholds. Gold upholds life, as we have said. It brings great purpose to life, greater purpose. So if you wish your life to have a little bit more purpose or knowledge or understanding or depth, you may use the symbol of gold in order to draw that to you. It is the symbol of gold that in many ways will be just as representative than a bar of gold bullion put before you, though certainly you would think differently now. A small something fashioned in gold will automatically say to you and to the senses that you value a truth, that you value longevity, that you value that which transmutes and comes forward in its highest through the body or through the being, that you are an initiate on the path of discovery, that you look to the sun and what the sun offers to you as well as that which gives, supports, and sustains life. That wealth is more than an accumulation of things with value that lessens, that instead it is in fact simply a symbol for that which is life everlasting or life that begets life. So here, in a very real sense, in a very present sense, is a way that you can relate to both value, gold, money, desires, and to balance these for yourself. If you like, it would be opportune for you as well to give yourself to certain very simple breathing exercises in which as you receive the in-breath or the inhalation, you allow that not only pranic energies, healing, life-giving energies are being received by you, but that which in its finest, almost invisible substance even that which is held within the simplest of a kosh actually contains gold dust as well. The primordial kind, the elemental kind, the most original of all, that which is still part of the universe, of the environment, of the atmosphere. Swallow it. It is life-giving. Draw it to you. And remember that the inhalation and the exhalation must be in balance. It must be an even exchange. So you need not have fear that as you receive the pranic elemental gold into your body, that you will exhale it all away. You will receive its properties, 
some of which are symbolic, some of which are physically quite a gesture, quite a receivable gesture as a matter of fact. Allow your thoughts to be original in the moment in which you perform this breathing exercise. An original thought is one that sustains only the moment. An original or creative thought will allow this elemental gold to multiply within you. Remember I have said to you that there are conditions under which gold almost on its own can multiply. Well, in this fine example, the finer substance of a refined thought, that will very quickly assist the body in recognizing what is taking place, tracing its steps very quickly throughout time and history and lifetimes, and I assure you, it will identify and find one or more lifetimes in which you already had this ability, in which you were already an initiate, in which you had already received the bread of life. And you might even have your memories of times before this, lives before this, and even life times upon other worlds before this. You are not limited to the memories of here, you know. So here then we continue with the subject of value and monies, economies, accumulations, wealth and wellness, where it comes from, how to extend it, how to expand it, and how to move beyond need or want into a greater place of balance. In this time, then, in which the world says, Oh, it is economic downturn. Oh, we have less today than what we had yesterday. Oh, these are less than optimal times. This is the very best of times to recognize them, where you are, how you are, so that you can begin to change not simply just your circumstances, but the very thoughts associated with life. Ask yourself in this moment then, what is your particular version of wealth and what wealth looks like? What does a wealthy life look like to you? Does it, for instance, include a great deal of leisure and leisure activities? Is a wealthy life one that would allow you to travel more frequently? Would it give you freedom from this or that? Is a wealthy life one that simply would give to you more time? Is time a desirable element? Is time as desirable as gold? Well, in some ways it is. What is superior to something else? You see, that is one way to determine what has more wealth for you. What things have a higher or more superior value? As you begin to determine for yourself your truth, and it is important that you ask the distillation process to distill for you what is more superior, what is more accurate for you. You will begin to find, of course, that you have many likenesses as compared to others, but that there are a few unique elements that make your particular version of wealth different from that of others. Begin to hone in on that in all the ways in which it is possible for you to do so. It is an activity that only you can do for yourself. You may find that in a simple meditative moment that is a little bit more empty of other thoughts, you would arrive at a more graceful conclusion or that you will be able to have less thoughts in this direction. 
For the most part, your initial thoughts will not be the most correct ones because what you think you want are in essence things that you need and they are more easily achievable than what you think. And if indeed someone were to give you some gold and say, well, since you have said that this item is the one that you truly want, then surely you will trade the gold for it. And yet you would find in this moment that you would not. So here is a fine example or tool that you can use for yourself in this process. When you think of those things that are more valuable, decide in a moment, if I were given a basket, a bushel, a bar of gold, would I trade it for this thing, for this thought or this belief that I am certain that I want or need? See what the answer is. If the answer is no, then you have not yet honed it down enough and you are to return to the exercise whenever possible. Eventually you will arrive at one or two or three items that are the most valuable to you, that would sustain life, that would encourage life, that would make you the best or better you than you can imagine. Once you have arrived at these things, it matters little if you have honed it down to one. If it is more than one, so be it. In essence, they will be related. They will be cousins of one another. Then begin to draw to yourself that, not based upon need, not based upon want, based upon a certain and simple and true desire. Desire comes from a different place altogether. Desire comes from a place that knows the relationship that things have between cause and effect, ebb and flow. Desire does not come from cause and effect. It comes from cause and cause, as a matter of fact. Cause and cause being, well, the God in all things, or the God that creates and therefore creates God, or the God that knows that it is God and can therefore have and be all things. You see, desire, in essence, is a form of culmination, or a form, a higher form of gold. Desire those thoughts and things and experiences that uplift life, that give life quality. If you like, you can call it the gold standard of life. Decide this from a very objective place within you, a place that is able to observe you choosing this, a place that is the I, but it is also the I am. In other words, a place that sees the desire but, because it is cause and cause, a place that already sees and has all that it desires. Cause and cause already assumes that you have the desire. It already at least acknowledges its presence, its accessibility, and its ability to sustain itself. So a desire can also sustain itself. When you need something, unless you have that thing that fulfills that need, you are not present in your fullness in the moment because you are in need. You are elsewhere attempting to find or secure that need. When you want something, you are on the search for that. You are also then the seeker, but the seeker that does not find. When you are in want, you are always in want. It is difficult to move out of want and out of need. If you find, however, your way into desire, which you can do with the I, then desire is cause as cause. 
rather than cause and effect. Cause as cause always returns to itself because it is itself. Imagine that cause and effect must go round and round the spiral or the labyrinth in and out, out and away. Desire finds its way into the center and radiates outward like the sun. It is life sustaining, it is self supporting. So the self within you desires and the human nature aspect of you needs and wants. While you cannot completely disengage from need or want, you can recognize what part of you needs and wants and what part of you, the self, already has and already attracts and already draws to it. So the difficulty, for instance, with the laws of attraction is that they are not, for the most part, employed correctly. They are employed from a place of need and want. The law is seen only as a means to get what is needed or wanted. Desire and the law of attraction, as an instance, are one. They are equal and their energy. You see the frequency of desire and the frequency of attraction are cause and cause. Desire being an electric component. Attraction being a magnetic component. So here you have the properties, the electromagnetic properties of perfect thought at work. This principle is called a dynamic principle. And if you will engage and employ this principle, and there are others, it will accelerate life and life force. Dynamic principles is perhaps a subject that we will engage in for another topic. And yet, it is valuable enough here, notable enough that it is worth mentioning. As you begin to work, then, with the principle of cause as cause in order to discover the true value of things, you will also find that life itself has more value, more meaning. The side effects of this is that you will begin to trust your day or trust life, trust your thoughts more. You will have more thoughts, but less belief about your thoughts. You see, currently, you must talk yourself into your thoughts. You must be certain that you believe in them. And part of the way that you do that is by believing as others do and convincing yourself that you believe as others do, all the while struggling with your individual self, your unique self, which struggles against this by proving to the rest of the world that you are different after all. And so you think similar thoughts to others and then struggle against them and then you are caught in the web of your own beliefs. One of the ways through this web then is again to return to the value of cause in cause, cause as cause, cause as the equivalent to cause, cause as cause as a formula for thought, for life, and as a dynamic principle for drawing to you those things of great value. Things of great value are sometimes important, but you cannot place them upon a scale of importance. Decide what and where you are, and you will begin to see that you will draw to you those things gold in color, gold in ideas. It will seem to you that when you give yourself to this breathing technique, you will even visualize the color gold, golden yellow, gold as the metallic substance. And perhaps, perhaps, you will begin to see a different kind of gold, one that is a little bit more white in color, one that shimmers but of a different kind of luster, as if it had just emerged from the sun itself. 
not the gold that is common to the earth, which is combined with other metals such as nickel or silver or copper, not that. The gold that comes from the universe, from dark matter, from the sun, a golden thought, a golden awareness, a golden life that has been tempered already, one that no longer reacts to life, one that even when it is dissolved by life, forms, reforms itself into something more pure, not less, one that understands the power to transmute from the lesser to the greater, even by dissolving itself into nothing, that which would absorb it into nothing only seeks to purify it. So we arrive then at the end of a simple but important discussion. And the end then is to find that which is genuine. It is to find those things, those peoples, those relationships, those thoughts and creations that are genuine for you. Those things that are genuine touch you. They are moments, they are experiences of life. Life fulfilling life, life fulfilling purpose, life extending life and life drawing to it the sacred, you will find that if you apply these principles to every aspect of life, you will have and live a wealthier life, a life that is lived truly upon a golden standard, where you are not tested every day to see if you can uphold your truth where you will trust yourself as cause to create all those things that give value for you and for others. You will find that this increases your wealth as well, your monetary wealth as well, for that is the topic after all. But here I give to you a simpler version, an alchemical version of how not only to have wealth but worth as well. You see, that is part of the difficulty with life upon earth now. While those that are present, that have great wealth, there is less worth to that which they bring forward, less lasting worth. So, sweet ones, draw to yourself those things that last, those things that live on beyond the one moment those things that desire simply for the sake of culminating a desire. This will be the crowning achievement of your life, of the forces by which you interact, of that which you seek and draw to you. And in all ways, I will accompany you, I will acknowledge you, I will empower you, I will walk beside you and continue to support beyond this moment and beyond these words. Until the next moment, sweet ones, I bid you good day.